So, hey, um, welcome everybody. I'm Ed Friedman, Chair of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. Thanks a lot for coming tonight. Uh, we're, a, we're a unique conservation organization in the mid coast of Maine. <clears throat> um, unique because we take a holistic view of, of the environment and, and really focus our program work on um, research, advocacy, land conservation, and education. And there's a few slides here that kind of show you some pretty pictures of stuff we've done over the years and, and highlight a few things. Uh, Multi-year circulation study of the bay it's on our website. You can see animations of how this soup bowl works. Um, uh, done some limited invasive species removal. Uh, first in the state to use caged bivalves to um, see whether or not pulp mills were still discharging dioxin and to locate some PCB hotspots on a lot of archaeology uh, with the Maine Historic Preservation Committee, typically on land we protected. So we, we often let our um, research um, lead our advocacy or inform our advocacy, I should say. A lot of our work revolves around fish passage, and a lot of that has got to do with turbine mortality. And you can see these gross photos of the, the dead out migrating um, uh, female American eel up here that came through the turbines up here at the um, Benton Falls Dam uh, that now now fixed um, and ale life down here. So it's not limited to eels, done a lot with toxins and posting areas for fish consumption advisories. So forth, working on PFAS chemicals now to some extent. Um, uh, education, very historically very active program with the elementary age kids particularly. Um, and of course we have this program as well. COVID's uh, knocked back our uh, hands-on uh, kids stuff quite a bit, but we're still doing some good, still doing some good stuff with, with them in a more limited audience. Uh, protected now probably well over 1,500 acres. Our focus is on valuable wildlife habitat uh and wetlands typically around the bay we, we've got like 10,000 acres of, of good habitat around here uh the bay for those of you who don't know is the junction of six rivers uh here forming a a, a tidal riverine system tidal freshwater system that geologically is considered an inland delta drains via about 200 meters uh, uh th through about a 200 meter bedrock slot to um Kennebec River and down to the ocean in about 17 miles. If you like the program uh, or want to look at any of our other ones, if you go to the home page, friendsofmerrymeetingbay.org or f1b.org, and slide down to education on the right side. Right here, you'll see a speaker series video um, list. And so we have recordings going back to like 2010. And after a few days, this one will be up there as well. Here's the, the rest of the series uh, for this year. I uh, invite you to join us next month. These are typically on the second Wednesday of each month between October and May uh, because of a scheduling conflict. Uh, February is going to be on a Thursday. So remember Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Uh, John Waldman is a conservation biologist focusing on aquatic species, a professor down at Queens College, the city of New York. Done a lot with fish restoration up here in the, in the Northeast. And here we go. So I'll, I'll introduce Will and myself and then uh, kind of kick things off with a, a question or two for Will and let him get going. Um, this, so so Will, Will Stolzenberg is a former wildlife biologist and he writes and speaks on behalf of wild things and uh, wild and tame things, I should say, given his latest book, Topaz Tail. Um, and he does this really because he, he finds critters wondrous uh, and good for the soul. It, it haunts him to know how badly we often treat them. And because uh, every, um, every voice deserves a compassionate ally. And uh, so for much of Will's career, he's covered the science of wildlife conservation. He's gravitated towards um, uh, what are often particularly maligned um, predators. Um, his fang and claw fascination inevitably led him to a cadre of what he calls rabble rousing scientists that um, were kind of flipping the, the basics of ecology on, on its head uh, and looking at critical roles of critical roles, sorry, of Earth's you know topmost predators, or often called apex predators, 
uh, and how those predators often enrich and, and uh, sort of govern the ecosystems they're in and enrich the web of life. So his first book, Where the Wild Things Were, um, uh, which Barnes and Noble chose as one of its Discover Great New Writers selections, that was the first book. And then uh, he got another uh, a, 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 a fellowship from Alicia Patterson Foundation uh, and, and uh, wrote a, a sequel to that, sort of, as he says, a twisted sequel, Rat Island, on what happens when alien predators <coughs> Go bonkers uh, uh, on an oceanic island, and and uh, what happens to try and get rid of them? And then he uh, he wrote this unplanned. Th the third in this unplanned trilogy was Heart of the Lion, uh, following the footsteps of this uh, male cougar looking for love who found his way from South Dakota to Greenwich, Connecticut. And uh, we had a talk about that a few years ago by Chris Spatz. I don't know if Chris is on the call tonight or not. Um, so a, a couple of quotes I'll give you, and I'll say a, a, a couple of words about me, and then we'll get going. Um, um, he's got, Will's gotten extremely high praise. I think all your books are out of print, Will, as far as I know, but they are available, you know, used through, you know, maybe some bookstores, but certainly on the web. Uh, E.O. Wilson, who many of you know, is a, just deceased really, fairly recently, professor emeritus at Harvard, written a lot about ants. Um, science writing at its best. Big fierce animals have a notable champion in William Stolzenberg. George Schaller, a notable bo uh, wildlife biologist for years and years and years, and president of the um, what used to be the Bronx Zoo, now the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, with a lucid and sparkling voice, William Stolzenberg explains clearly why we need the wolf, tiger, and other predators, large and small, to maintain a healthy environment. And then lastly, I'll say here's one from Mike uh, Andrews who is or was vice president and a senior conservation fellow at TNC, the Nature Conservancy. Um, I wanna say this thoughtfully, Where the Wild Things Were is one of the most fascinating and well-written books I've read in years. It is wonderful. I can't believe anyone interested in nature or wild places would find it otherwise. It keeps me turning from tail to tail, from one compelling personality to the next and saddened by coming to the end, a beautiful book. So um, Will writes beautifully. I encourage everyone on the call, if you haven't read his books, to uh, find them in a library or online, something like that, and, and enjoy them. Um, as, as for me, um, I've got a broad-based background in natural sciences. I've been chair of Friends of Mary Meaning Bay for, for far too long, like 1996. Um, I've got about 40 years of experience as an outdoor educator and also doing um, a bunch of wildlife research. I have a BS in environmental science. Uh, I've, I've worked from the Antarctic to uh, the Arctic. Uh, probably a highlight for me has been working on caribou in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge back in the like 1982 or something like that when we were doing baseline research on the on the refuge. And then the, a lot of my ologies have been wildlife related, ecology, biology, and glacial related geology, glaciology, and so forth. So, uh, and I really want to thank our treasurer, Vance Stevenson, who's out in Ohio, been a member and treasurer of ours for quite a while for suggesting that I contact Will to join us tonight. So, thank you all. And uh, so, um, I'm going to say, um, if you could. Um, Give us a, a brief explanation of, of where the wild things were, of what the wild, what, where the wild, what, where, it's tongue twister, right? What, where the wild things were is about and, and how you uh, got the idea of writing a book about this. Um, and, and I'd like you to kind of get into the issue of, you know, how many predators there used to be around here and why we all forget that. Sure. Yeah, we'll give it a go. Yeah. So thanks. Um, yeah, this this book, Where the Wild Things Were, it's basically a it's a story about these big, furry, kind of feathered, scaly creatures who uh, who for a living they hunt other creatures, and in doing so, they literally change the way the world looked and behaves. And this is for the good, and by the good, I mean for the common good, in that they are these benefactors of biological diversity, okay? 
And uh, the idea for this book came to me while I was, uh, I was covering this conference in Missoula, Montana uh, for a magazine I worked for at the time. And um, I, uh, I was there um, and it wasn't very long before I discovered that there was, this, uh, there was this symposium that attracted me. It was called, let's see, it was called The Role of Top Predators in Ecological Communities and Biological Conservation. Um, sounds really geeky, but it really, it really spoke to me. And what it was all about was that this, there's this small cadre of scientists who are coming forth with this, uh, this new blossoming science of, 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 of the role of top predators in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the fabric of life. And since that time, it's been it's been encouraging to, to find that this this field of science, this top town ecology, has kind of exploded. It has gone it has gone global. It has gone mainstream. I mean, how many people out there have not by now heard of the resurrection of the forests and streams of Yellowstone National Park following the return of the wolf? And so this is what uh, this is what really jazzed me at the time. I wasn't sure at the time, but I. Uh, you know, I came away with sort of an epiphany that this was something that I was going to be pursuing for a long time. But as it turns out, I, I whenever I go to a conference like there, particularly particularly in a place like Missoula, Montana, I always try to budget a few extra days um, to explore the countryside. And in this particular case, I decided that uh, with my time, I was going to do something that I had never done before. I'd been all over the West as a reporter, as an academic. Um, I, uh, I had worked out west as a wildlife technician, and I had never yet seen a grizzly bear. And so I decided what I was going to do with my time after this conference was I was going to finally see the grits. So uh, what I did was afterwards, as, as soon as the, con the, uh, the uh, conference let out, I headed out. And I think uh, probably at this time, and the best way for me to describe what happened after that would be to read a short uh, a short segment from my book, Where the Wild Things Were. This is the prologue uh, to the book. It's called The Grizzly in the Room. And this is how my, my search for the grizzly unfolded. Nine days after my awakening in Missoula, I was standing alone at dusk just outside the northwest corner of Yellowstone National Park, atop an open knoll ringed on all horizons by ranges of the Northern Rockies. Earlier in the day and far behind, I had passed a sign at the trailhead reading, warning, grizzly bears are active in this area. And after reconnoitering the countryside, I had determined that this natural amphitheater would indeed be a good place to seek an answer or two about the objective nature of carnivore journalism. As the skylight faded, I stood on the lonely knoll, slowly turning in circles. There was less faith than duty in my exercise. Scanning the surrounding hillsides for bears, I held no serious hopes of conjuring. Around I turned, drifting between distant mountain peaks and the purpling skies in the purest of silence, dusk dreaming. The trail heading back would soon be too dark to follow, time to go. I turned one last quarter to the north and watched the grizzlies. A sow and two cubs. A sow and two cubs had magically materialized on the hillside, two roundish nubs trailing behind a dark boulder of fur, placidly pawing through a seep on the edge of an aspen grove. I slowly raised my binoculars. I lowered them and looked to the lone pine standing about a seven second sprint to my left, estimating its lowest branch at six feet high. I pulled out my field journal and scribbled some notes, ostensibly recording some key facet of natural history I pretended to be observing. When I look at those notes today, I see the jerky scratchings of an overexcited child. When I remember the heart pounding presence those bears had imparted over the distance, a distance that could just as likely have measured a hundred paces as a half mile. I remember why this book for all its inherent hazards needed writing. Now, this was my way of trying to explain something about this book, which was not just a book of science, but it's also a book about us. Because one of the things that I've learned since then, and one of the things that I kind of had an inkling for then, and why I wrote this prologue was that it's 
the science really isn't going to save the day for these animals after all. It's going to be something else that comes from the heart. And uh, it's, it's, it's something else that I think that we need to consider that, the, again, as much science as I, I, I geeked out on this book and everything, at the end of the day, it's going to be how we as a society decide that we are going to coexist with these animals. And it's going to take a, a certain amount of compassion on our part that, again, is going to be necessary for, for what we're talking about here. So, again, I, it's, it's, it's kind of a disclaimer for me that, again, this is supposed to be a book of science about top predators, but there is this, there's this underlying current that is about, again, you and I and, and um, rewilding our own hearts, if you will. So, Oh, um, did, that, did that answer your question, Ed? Yeah, I think so. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and and I, so uh, before I just uh, pop on to the next, um, I remembered what I forgot, which was that we welcome um, questions from people. And we've got some very, very informed people on this call. And so use the chat uh, chat mode there. And we'll, we'll kind of stop at some point before 8 o'clock. And, and Martin or I can kind of field some of those. And, and uh, you know, Will or I can can answer those while we welcome your participation. And again, we've got some really excellent and knowledgeable people on the on the call. So 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 tell us um, how how top down ecology works. Um, uh, why are these sort of larger predators? And and I, I use the word larger because we we're talking about grizz, but I think it's important to and you can you can address this that uh, not all apex predators are large. So yeah. what so what's so important about them? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's handy. I actually have a, a slide that, okay, so the, uh, this is basically, again, this is a really simplistic illustration of what we're going to be talking about here, but uh, ecologists out there, please don't hammer me for this, but basically this is the concept that um, ecologists for a while, they've kind of viewed the the uh, community of life is being shaped like a pyramid. That being, there's a very large base at the bottom that's made up of, of green plants. We're basically eating carbon dioxide and sunlight. They feed a smaller layer of, on top of them of plant eaters. And perched at the very top is this very rare um, and biggest uh, topmost predators of all that eat the plant eaters beneath them. So um, this is basically, again, how they think that life is, is basically uh, um, shaped, but the question becomes now, um, especially in this day and age, of what happens when um, the top predator disappears from the pyramid of life. And this is basically the question what these scientists have been asking all along here. Um, and we're just starting to come with some of the, the answers now, which is, of course, the, the, the topic of my book, Where the Wild Things Were. And uh, yeah, go ahead. That, that's, that's basically it for me, Ed. Oh, so, so yeah. So what? So what? Um, so in terms of importance, it's it's that they're they're keeping these uh, well, these, these under control. What what happens when what what happens when we eliminate our apex predators, which we're really really good at doing? You know? Yes, and that I mean we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, that's that's basically the issue right now. Basically, two thirds of our top predators are now considered to be in danger uh, or they're threatened with extinction. Eight out of 10 are on the decline. So this is a worldwide problem that basically we, we as a society and as ecologists need to face. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, let's go back to some of the, one of the seminal examples of, of this top-down ecology that we're talking about on which some of these, um, some of these assumptions are based. So this is, this is a uh, what's called a North Pacific kelp forest. Um, this is a uh, uh, kelp forest is one of the most vibrant and fertile marine ecosystems out there. Um, these, the, this is basically uh, these, these kelp strands here, they can grow to be 200 feet high. Uh, they grow about two feet a day. Um, but more than this, they are basically this structure of food and shelter that supports, supports a, a huge variety of wildlife. And uh, uh, you know, more than one ecologist has basically referred these to as the basically the, the, the marine equivalent of a tropical rainforest. Now, this is basically its antithesis. This is a, um, this is called an urchin barren and those green blobs, that's what those are. Those are sea urchins. Sea urchins are vegetarian cousins to the starfish. Sea urchins like to eat kelp 
And when sea urchins are left unchecked, this is what happens. Um, now, there is something else going on in many of these ecosystems, and it is, uh, it is, it is this animal here. This is the sea otter. The sea otter is the, is the largest and most seaworthy of the weasel family. It's found in coastal waters all the way from the Siberian coast across the Aleutian uh, archipelago through Alaska and down to California. And in the 1970s, a, a marine biologist by the name of Jim Estes began researching uh, this question of really what impact the sea otter has on its communities in these near shore communities across the Aleutians. And he had this wonderful experiment set up in which the sea otters was at this point, they had almost been exterminated by fur hunters in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, but if enough of them were left when they finally uh, uh, sanctioned a, a treaty to, to stop the killing, um, that they started coming back. But they left some islands without sea otters, some islands with, with otters. Estes went around and tracked uh, what was happening underneath. And lo and behold, um, you can guess what would happen in here in the lower left-hand corner. This is what he found when he dove in those places that had restored their sea otters, upper right-hand corner is what happened was where the sea otters were absent. The thing is, sea otters love to eat sea urchins. Um, they're one of its favorite foods. And when they find them in abundance, they just pop them down like popcorn. So this is one of the very first and uh, uh, seminal studies that showed the impact of top predators on their communities. Do, do, do we have any idea of the numbers of um, sort of apex predators that were here in North America, um, you know, when the, when the, the uh, Europeans first came over here. And could you kind of summarize the, the concept of shifting baselines for folks, how easily we forget, you know? Yeah, well, you know, this is, this is kind of an example of one. If, if you had, say, dove in these waters before the sea otter had been returned and just looked at these urchin barrens, you might, you might think that this is the way that things are supposed to look. Okay, the sea otter shows us something different. And in terms of historically, yeah, we've lost uh, we've lost a great percentage of the great mammals. I mean, if you want to go all the way back to the Pleistocene, we lost something like seventy percent of all the of the of the large terrestrial um, mammals and predators in in this in, in North America. So yeah, we're dealing with a very uh, depopulated uh, cast of characters in this country. But that's that's the question now. I mean, we do have some some possibilities for rewilding. Uh, we do have, we do still have a, a, a cast of characters that could perform these functions. And so this is where the idea of conservation comes in and, and uh, bringing some of these animals back. But so far, again, it's uh, like I said, the science is, is, the, is, is building, it's buttressing this idea that these things are very, very important, um, vital to the diversity of life. The question remains is, you know, what are we as a society going to, to do for them? Do we have any kind of a sense of um, the megafauna that was here before, you know, North America was settled, even and 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 before, you know, I'm talking mammoths and mastodons and stuff. Do you, you have a sense of whether their demise was also, you know, was due? Yeah, this is this is been, yeah this this is one of the most hotly debated subjects in ecology, and it's been going on for. I almost wrote a book about this about thirty or forty years ago, but yeah, one of the, the one of the theories is that yeah, when when the uh, Siberian spear hunters came over from the uh, the Bering Strait, um, but and and this is another question: when did that happen? When did the Amer when was America peopled? And every year you. There's a new study coming out saying that it, they're pushing it back. But let's say about 14,000 years ago, we know that these, um, these big game hunters from Siberia made it across the Bering Strait and made their way down into America. And they met this wonderful menagerie of huge animals, mastodons, math, uh, mammoths, and, and uh, several species of big cats that were way larger than anything we have in this country now, way larger than anything that's even in Africa right now. These were huge animals. Um, this, was, this was quite the bestiary. Um, and very soon after that, they all disappeared, okay? And some of them, uh, in particular mammoths, have been found with spear points in their ribs. Um, so th th this was kind of like the smoking gun that said, well, these people did it. These people came, they met this continent full of these massive beasts who had never seen people before. They were very naive, and they slaughtered them piecemeal right down 
the chain. Um, there are others who say, no, wait a minute, people came way before then, so they, they predated this huge extinction mm -hmm. event. Um, so again, and I think just a, a week or so, guys, there's another new study out that says in Idaho, they, they found spear points that are supposedly 16,000 years old. So um, again, it's, and the other, one of the other arguments about what happened to our megafauna was that, uh, well, the ice age must have done it. You know, this all happened on the, on the tail of the last ice age. Well, it must have been the change in climate. Well, unfortunately for the climate uh, proponents, this sort of thing happened uh, a dozen of times before, you know, where we had climatic oscillations that should have done the same thing, but they didn't. So the smoking gun remains the fact that people had entered this continent with a very, uh, with, with big weapons, with big spear points. And, um, you know, basically a naive prey base. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's, um, <clears throat> no, because we're in the Northeast, um, let's dig a little bit into um, what, what I call rodents with hooves. <laughs> um, white, and, white and of course on the West Coast, black-tailed deer, uh, maybe even elk um, in, in places like, you know, uh, Wisconsin, British Columbia, the Alleghenies, the Great Smokies, uh, Staten Island, uh, Anacostia Island on the St. Lawrence River, Maine. Um, we have huge problems with these um, cervid uh, overpopulations. Could you speak to uh, some of that, some possible solutions maybe, uh, and, and how, we, how we got, I mean, how we got here is we, we lost our predators, presumably. So, yeah. so, so what, what, are, what are some of the solutions, uh, novel and, and, and standard and, and talk to that, talk to that if you could speak to that if you could well let's let's first talk about what what the problem is we have too many deer um and this is this is a slide right here this is a, a picture that was taken in pennsylvania i hope everyone's seen this picture but uh yeah we're talking about deer can you guess on which side of the fence the deer are and which side the deer aren't mm -hmm. right so and this is unfortunately this is a this is a picture that can be reproduced in many other states throughout throughout the country in which basically the deer have, uh, of, have stopped reproduction of the forest. There are large swaths of forest in the, in the east in which a, a marketable timber is no longer uh, possible because the deer are mowing it to the ground before it grows. Now, um, we are basically talking about deer that, what, what biologists have, have, have estimated that most of the east, the decidu deciduous forests of the east can sustain roughly 10 to 12 deer per square mile. Um, we now have deer at densities approaching 400 square miles, uh, 400 per square mile in certain places in this country. So obviously um, there's a problem here. Now, um, what it, it's not only it's not only reproduction of the forest that's happening here. Um, again, it's, you asked what am, one of the reasons for it. Well, we have basically made a, a, a candy land for deer. Now, this is, this is somebody who's feeding the deer, but also when you think about what deer eat, deer are an edge species. Uh, deer, uh, the, you know, they're not necessarily an animal of the deep forest. A lot of people think that, but no, they're an edge species. And what does develop and what are suburbs? They're basically creating a bunch of edge in uh, what used to be wildlands and so it's just become a, 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 a bounty for white-tailed deer um, and this is this is one of the the impacts of it this is a place where I used to live in, in uh, northern Virginia this is Japanese stilt grass and notice the lack of reproduction in the understory um, Japanese stilt grass deer don't like to eat Japanese stilt grass and this is taking over large swaths of parkland in uh, in the in the east um, Another impact of deer, uh, we, we often think, it, for those birders out there who like the warblers or the neotropical migrants, we often think of birds as being protected up in the trees, but a lot of these animals, they're ground nesters, they're shrub nesters, and so deer are basically eating them out of house and home. We don't have a real good, uh, uh, um, a real good um, an idea how many, how bad this problem is, but it can't be very good. Um, another thing, um, Lyme disease, uh, 150,000 cases of Lyme disease a year. They're carried by this animal. This is the black-legged tick. It's uh, also known as the deer tick. Now, uh, we don't get Lyme disease from the, the big ones. We get them from the little tiny ones, as you probably know, if, if you've 
need to check yourself after you come in from the field. These are the tiny pinprick ones. Those are the ones that carry the bacterium that gives us Lyme disease. Um, and those are not the ones that, uh, uh, they're not getting the disease from deer, but they are being born to these, uh, these adults on the left. And those are the ones that deer carry in great numbers. Here's another thing, a little bit more personal. Um, we, about 1.5 million people per year um, suffer run-ins with deer. They cost us over a billion dollars in damage. And, and more to the point, there's a, a 150 to 200 of us die from deer vehicle collisions. Let me just go back here for a minute. So what's, what's the issue here? Again, um, I mentioned that we've created a lot of habitat for these animals. We feed these animals. Um, we don't have as many hunters out on the, on the landscape anymore. The hunt, hunters are, uh, the ranks of hunters are declining. But the other thing, obvious thing, the reason we're talking about predators today, they no longer have wolves and cougars on their tails like they used to. Okay, so this is, this is something that we need to consider if, if we want to restore our, our forests, you know, um, and people ask, well, why, you know, why can't the hunters take care of it? Well, num number one, again, the hunting ranks are going down, but hunters, uh, human hunters go about their business a lot different than uh, native carnivores go about their business. Human hunters, they have seasons, so they're out there certain uh, times of the year, a month or two, maybe, but Carnivores are out there uh, 24-7, 365 days a year. So there's a huge difference in, in the way they impact uh, their prey as opposed to a human hunter who's carrying a rifle and, you know, and, and gets to certain places. There's another, there's another aspect to this that, uh, that doesn't involve actually killing is called the ecology of fear, whereby, um, and Chris Spatz, I think, is, is one of the great proponents, and he may have even coined this term, but the deer... Uh, uh, the wolves and the cougars, they act as, as deer shepherds. In other words, they move these animals around. It's not just a matter of how many animals they kill, reducing them or deer, but it's the behavior that they changed. These animals aren't allowed to lounge in certain places where they can just munch to their heart's content. They, they are now having to watch their backside. They're now having to spend more time instead of, you know, with heads down in the trough all the time, they're constantly looking up, you know, that takes energy. That takes energy that could have gone into reproducing more deer, um, and it actually it, it's 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 a it's a it's an actual factor in reproduction. It's it's the difference, say, of of doe having uh, triplets or twins as opposed to a doe having a single fawn a year. It's based on the condition they're in, based on how much food they can take in, and a lot of that is is based on fear. A lot of that is based on how much time they can actually spend eating as opposed to looking around for predators there. So. Um, I hope that's a, a long-winded answer to your question, Ed. Yeah. Um, I'll point out that I, re I recommend to folks that the current um, Earth Island Journal, the winter issue, has a great little article on deer overpopulation on Staten Island, in New York City, where the density is like 92 per square mile, and they are using some very expensive male sterilization, $2,800 a pop because you know you can't be shooting around these high density population areas really um, well so yeah, I, will, I will add to that i used to live in fairfax county in north virginia we had a we had a lot of deer um we had a lot of parks and what they were doing is they were taking professional sharpshooters in at night with spotlights and basically killing deer um in in rather um rather dense neighborhoods i should say but they were they were killing deer by a single shot to the head with with spotlights. But again, it's it's like you know plugging the you know plugging the dam with your thumb. It's it, it's as soon as you kill deer out of a park, I mean, there's just they're just surrounded by other deer, and it just it's a vacuum, you know. So that's why this idea of just you know these these deer cullings they call them um, are are not the, the final solution. We need to have some, we need to, again, this is this is an ecosystem that is out of balance because it's missing the apex predators. Um, you, I was gonna ask you about ecology of fear when you, you talked about it already, but, I'll, but I do wanna share with folks a, a, a great quote from your book, Wild, Th Wild Things, and, and then one other, um, and from your book, um, page 148, you say, death by fang, only begins to gauge the power of the predator's bite. 
the fear of those fangs has become an evolutionary force unto itself. So that's that's really uh, written beautifully. And there's a there's a great quote from behavior ecologist uh, Stephen Larry Dwill, uh, Dill. Uh, Few failures, however, are as unforgiving as the failure to avoid a predator. Being killed greatly decreases future fitness. Yeah, I like that one too. I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, and I and I should add again, you know, this is this is a phenomenon. This this uh, landscape or terrain of fear. Uh, it's it goes by several names, but um, it's not just on the land. It's in the water too. I mean, we've seen this with dugongs and tiger sharks in Australia, um, and and sea turtles as well. Again, why they're they're staying away from certain places. They're grazing in certain places more than other. But it is it is. It's a, a cascading effect in that by changing the behavior of the prey, which is a plant eater, they are changing where these animals are eating and actually allowing stiff uh, places, things like seagrass to grow where they weren't growing before. So again, this is, it's, it's a really tricky thing, this, this cascade of effects, but this is the thing that, again, the scientists are trying to suss out now. Well, something to keep in mind as, as our very thought, one of our very thoughtful board members uh, Nate Gray, who, who was on the call here and works with a fisheries biologist with DMR, and I were talking the other day, was that, you know, whether you're predator or prey depends totally on the perspective for the most part. So, you know, the the uh, uh, the alewife, which we have, you know, gazillions of here in Maine now in terms of restoration efforts as, as sort of always portrayed as this, um, you know, the sole purpose of the alewife is to be eaten, you know, um, that's that's not how the zooplankton looks at the the L life, you know. Uh, so um, so it's perspective. Um, let's talk about rewilding briefly, and, and um, maybe you can explain the the concept to folks, and then give us some top down examples, and 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 talk about some success stories of yeah. rewilding. Yeah. And you, you mentioned people have heard of the Yellowstone wolves. I don't know if everyone else, you know, everyone has or not, but, but there are other examples as well, you know, the otters and, and things in critters in Africa and so forth. So. Well, just real simply rewilding is bringing back these beasts that used to be here and should still be here. Right. And, 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 and they're not here. And, and, and the, we're talking about not, we're not talking about releasing lions in the middle of New York city. Okay. We're talking about places where there's still enough prey, still enough uh, green space, still enough area in which they can they can procreate and which you know again there's such a thing called a, a cultural caring capacity in which um, they can be tolerated by the citizens so um, but yeah you're right Yellowstone is a perfect example to talk about this um, there is a story that goes um, to Yellowstone and and it involves uh, this creature the the gray wolf but Basically, Yellowstone was just like every other place in the West way, way back. Um, there was the, there's the, the shooting gallery area, era of, of the uh, American West. And by the early 1900s, most of, our, our, most of the wolves have been driven from the country. And the last, in 1926, the last of the wolves in Yellowstone were trapped out. And so basically that park, that, you know, that, that sacrosanct park was a suddenly, um, you know, missing its top predator. And well, Back then, people thought that that was a good idea, right? Um, but what they found very soon is that the the elk went on a bender. You know, the elk, that's another um, you know the prize prizes of of Yellowstone. They they multiplied to stratospheric levels. They started eating down all of the willows, all of the cottonwoods, all of the aspens. These are these are three of the trees that support a lot of the biodiversity in these arid. Um, plains of the West. And so this became a, a serious concern. They started um, uh, uh, the solution for the Park Service for a long while was to, again, this culling. They would just round up the elk and kill them. Um, you know, and that, that got them in a lot of hot water. Public didn't like seeing that. And so they, they tried all sorts of things. They never really thought to bring back the wolf. It never really occurred to them that that was the problem. But basically, they have arrested uh, the reproduction of three of the primary um, uh, trees and forests of biodiversity in Yellowstone National Park. Well, thanks to uh, conservationists who were very um, stubborn and resilient and kept at it year after year after year, by 1995, we finally reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone. They came from Canada. And uh, very soon, they started doing what wolves are supposed to do, which is chase elk. And very soon after that, we started to see the impacts of a top predator and this, this 
issue that we, we think of called rewilding. One of the things is carrion. You know, wolves don't always finish everything they eat. And they provided this, what used to be a very harsh land in the winter became this year round banquet for all sorts of, of wildlife. Everything from grizzly bears down to like 57 varieties of beetle. Um, and we talked about those trees. Uh, this is the foreground here. This is, these are the, those willows, the streamside willows that are growing back now. And suspiciously, they've been gone for 70 years, the same amount of time as the wolves. Suspiciously, they are all of a sudden, they are coming back um, with the return of the wolf. Now, one of the, the, the idea behind this, again, is this is, uh, this relates to this idea of the ecology of fear that we're talking about. It's not just that the wolves are knocking down the number of elk, okay? Um, all they, they did, they, they reduced the, the population, but they are keeping elk from lounging in these places where they don't want to be caught dead. You know, the gravel banks and the, and the steep banks and these islands, these gravel beds in the river, places where the, uh, the wolf has the advantage. Now, if you, uh, if you put a wolf and an elk on a flat, a plane, the elk can outrun the wolf every time unless it has an injury. Okay. But when you start burying the terrain like this, this is where the wolf gains its advantage. And this is why the elk, again, stay away from places like this. Um, now, with the return of the, the um, willows, we have the return of the beaver. Again, along uh, just soon after the, the wolves were reintroduced, we start seeing beaver return to the, the north. Um, the northern herd of Yellowstone. And with beavers come, of course, their ponds. They come with uh, amphibians and fish and more birds. Uh, and it's just a, a chain of life that's, that's springing from um, wolves down to beavers, which themselves are ecosystem engineers. This is a, uh, this is a graphic that's uh, produced by the Oregon State University. Um, the scientists, Bill Ripple and Bob Beshta, were two of the primary scientists who are doing a lot of work. They're trying to suss out this, uh, the, the changes in Yellowstone following the return of the wolves. And you probably can't read the text, but basically you can see what's going on here that I've just described. The left is, is before the wolves. We see the, the stream is eroding. There's no, there's no willows on the banks. It's eroding, it's silting, nothing there but elk. Um, again, lounging to their heart's content, right? Um, on the right, again, after the, after the wolves, we have the beavers moved in, the birds have moved in, there's a little fox there. Um, in the background, you can see there's a grizzly bear who is probably taking advantage of, of an old carcass, carrion. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's the elk. They're still there, but they're not hanging out down in this stream bed, which makes all the difference for the reproduction of, um, of this. Now, this... this uh, the, the researchers I just mentioned, Ripple and Beshta, you know, they took this idea and said, no, wait a minute, this is happening in Yellowstone. Where else is it happening? And so they started looking in national parks all over the place. And this happens to be Zion National Park, where they, they did the same, they did a, a comparison of two streams, one that ran through the main canyon of Zion, which was full of people, didn't have many lions. And they found one that was almost identical um, over the, the, the mountain, and this one was full of mountain lions and full of a lot of other life. The streamside groves were growing. They had butterflies, they had frogs, they had fish. It was just a completely different surrounding. And the, the only uh, conclusion that could come to, the only difference between these two was the presence of, in this case, mountain lions. So again, this, this idea that, um, that predators can reshape the landscape through the ecology of fear is, is something that they've, and they continue to do this. They have, a, if you want to go to their website, the, they have a, an entire website devoted to what they, we call these things called trophic cascades. Well, I think that's, you know, I think that's remarkable and that, you know, we, we often tend to think of um, a change uh, staying with and affecting only one, uh, you know, part of the ecosystem, but, you know, we make a change here, as you've described in, in the, the the mammals and the the birds you know the avian landscape profits and the aquatic aquatic ecology profits um more shade in, in the river from the, the willows and other vegetation more higher dissolved oxygen better spawning nursery habitat all that so it it is all nicely um connected yeah so, so 
there, there have been some examples outside of the country as well. I think you mentioned, I think, in you know, Tanzania, maybe, um, some other areas. Can, do you want to mention any of those at all quickly? Uh, now, what, what are we what are we talking about now? Well, bush pigs. Um, well, oh, well, well, well. Um, it, it, could could you speak to some successes? Of, so you, you sort of described some rewilding and some yeah, okay, some sure. some physical changes. But could you speak right. to some successful examples of rewilding? Um, yeah, okay. So let's let's go there. Well, but basically, what I was gonna I was continue with here was that. And, and, and I've mentioned this before, is, is this is this is it. We've got all of these great predators, but again, they are occurring at very small densities, um, his, historically speaking. So the answer is, what do we do? Well, and this is, you know, I, I don't want to be too graphic here, but I have to show you, this is kind of the, this is what we're up against now. There is an, another, I mean, we're, I imagine everyone sitting in this room is probably um, uh, of the choir, you know? Um, but this is right now is what's happening to a lot of our predators. And it's not just, it's not just habitat loss and it's not just, it's not hunting. It's in many cases, it's hatred. Um, this particular picture here, I don't know. Um, this is, this is what's going, I just mentioned Yellowstone. Um, and, uh, I want to make a point about this right now is that Yellowstone now is the, the wolves of Yellowstone are under renewed attack. I mean, they were taken off the endangered species list some years back, but the, the surrounding states of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming have, uh, have taken it upon themselves to try to eradicate these animals. Now, the reasons that they use um, for going after these, these animals, and this one, we've, we've, we hear this all the time, is that Number one, if these these animals need to be managed, and by managed, this is this is uh, um, this is we, these these are weasel words that the agency uses. For managed, usually means kill, to be hunted. Uh, predators need to be managed or killed. Well, and if we don't manage them, that they will breed like rabbits. They will eat all of our elk, all of our deer. Then they'll go after our livestock. And after that, they're coming after our kids at the bus step. And, and I, I know it sounds like I'm being sarcastic here, but this is basically, this is, this is things, these are the exact phrases that I have heard from people in high standing positions who are, some of them sitting on commissions that determine the hunting regulations in these states. And it's been, and um, one of my colleagues out there will mention admit Suzanne Stone, who's working amidst these people says, this is not hunting. We have never seen sportsmen like this before. This is hatred, okay? And I can tell you right now. I mean, if 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 what we're doing to if if what we're doing to wolves right now, if those were people, there wouldn't be any other word for it but genocide, okay? Yeah. Now, I don't mean to be too graphic about this or to dwell on this, but um, there are certain things that need to be said. And right now, it's it's reached an emergency situation out there. The wolves of Yellowstone, as soon as they leave the park are getting hammered. There are 24 of them have been killed this year that I know of, or last year at least. Um, so yeah, let's, let's remember that it's not all as well because of the wolves have returned to Yellowstone. But here we are. This is what I wanted to get to here in answer to your, your question, Ed. Um, this is the Wolf River, uh, excuse me, this, this is the, um, the Wood, Wood River um, uh, Wolf project. And this is, uh, this is headed by Suzanne Stone and, and her colleagues. But basically, this is an experiment um, with uh, combining uh, shepherds with scientists in an attempt to raise sheep in one of the, um, you know, one of the most hotly contested areas of the country. This is, this is the middle of Idaho. This is one of the largest uh, sheep herds in the country. And these sheep are surrounded by packs of wolves. And they are doing a, a, an amazing job of keeping these sheep safe with several techniques, all of them non-lethal. That's the key right here. They are trying to prove that we don't need to kill predators to, to coexist, even with livestock as helpless as sheep. Right there, we're, we're looking at, this is, is called fladry, fladry um, but these little uh, uh, strips and uh, combined with electric fencing are remarkably effective at keeping wolves at bay. Um, another technique is, is basically they are keeping track of their wolves. They are, uh, they have collars on some of them. They know when the packs are near. This is called animal husbandry, right? They are just, 
they are out there where they should be watching their sheep and and controlling things that way. Another thing they use is is uh, guarding dogs. They're also using scare devices with um, uh, with horns and sirens and and um, and lights, flashing lights, letting the wolves know that hey, this place smells of people. Wolves don't like people, and it's been remarkably successful. Um, this is the name of their organization. It's headed by, again, by Suzanne Stone. Um, and by the way, they have several other projects going here. And it, well, let me just back up and say how successful this is, that they, they are, I think, 17 years operating now, they lose on average 4.5 sheep per year to wolves. And that's better than a lot of other producers who are, again, using lethal methods, and it's cheaper, right? So this these ideas that, um, uh, you need to kill wolves in order to be uh, economically successful out there. Uh, they are disproving that day in and day out. They also have, now they've gone uh, international. They now are are working on jaguars in Mexico. They're doing uh, snow leopards in Nepal, um, lions in Kenya. All of these are uh, aimed at coexisting with wildlife without killing them. And, and my hat's off to them. This is the sort of thinking that we need to get beyond those folks who, again, are 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 using um, violence as, as a means. Now, uh, here's another example right here. This is Yellowstone National Park. Um, these, are, these are wolf watchers. So 150,000 people a year come to Yellowstone just to see the wolves, right? They're pouring $35 million into the, the Yellowstone economy. And all they want to do, they want to see live wolves. So if you think about that, um, uh, those, those folks that are just outside the borders who are pounding these wolves, I mean, they are, to, sorry for the metaphor, but they are killing the goose that laid the golden egg, right? By killing their wolves. But that's what I mean when I say that the science, the evidence in many cases doesn't matter. This is what matters. And, and, and this is what I, uh, gives me hope because these people, I'm, I'm convinced of this, these people outnumber those people. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Ed. I've yeah, so that, that on for a while here. The, 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 so the cougar slide there, I'll just um, ask you um, how you became aware of the subject matter for Heart of the Lion and, and how yeah. you connect the dots there between South Dakota and Connecticut. And it is it is close to eight. So we'll, we'll kind of, you, you could, you know, we can, we can talk about that for a second. And then uh, I see there's a few questions in the chat room. We should probably see what's there and, and give, a, give a few people a uh, chance to, to get their questions answered too. Okay, okay. yeah, so anyway, yeah, I, I was gonna, this, this is another example of what gives me, um, it gives me hope. And uh, this is an animal, this is an animal we've come to call Walker. This animal was born in, in 2008 in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And uh, at the time I was, uh, I, was, I was working with a group called the Cougar Rewilding Foundation who were watching these animals that were coming east from the Rocky Mountains. Now the, the range of the mountain lion in this country basically ends at the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains. Um, there is a small colony of Florida panthers in Southern Florida, but basically uh, east of the Rocky Mountains, we have the Black Hills and a few satellite populations popping up in Nebraska. Basically that's it, okay? So when this animal, uh, we were, we, we, they had been, I should say, and I was just kind of tagging along and listening, but they had been tracking all of these animals that were popping up in the Midwest here and there with sightings, but they were all stopping right about maybe uh, Minnesota or Wisconsin, getting no further than that. Well, June 11, 2011, they got news of an animal that had been killed on a roadside in Connecticut, okay? Um, and this, everybody's ears went up when this happened. And, we, and the, the first guesses were, oh, this must be an animal. This must be an animal escaped from captivity. Well, when they took the animal in and gave it a necropsy, which is basically a wildlife autopsy, um, the, the facts uh, surprised everybody. And I think at this point, yeah, this, I ended up writing a book about this because the journey was so fantastic. Um, this is basically it here. Um, 1,500 miles straight, straight line shot from the Black Hills to Connecticut. But of course, anyone who's owned a cat knows that that's not quite how they travel. Well, they figure with the meanderings of this animal, what he actually did between the Black Hills and Connecticut probably <laughs> to, to 
uh, four to five times that. If we'd have straightened that line out, he probably, he could have crossed this continent twice coast to coast. But um, rather than going on about that, let me just read a, um, a, a brief passage about, um, about this animal that uh, describes some of the amazing discoveries they made after they, they took this animal in to have him checked out. Six weeks after scientists sliced and probed and sent bits of the lion's body to a genetics lab in Montana, his tests came back and his incredible saga emerged from the molecules. He was a three-year-old mountain lion from the Black Hills of South Dakota, and he had wandered under his own power for the better part of two years and more than 2,000 miles across the eastern two-thirds of North America. His journey had spanned at least six states and most likely Canada's largest province. The lion had not simply walked a long distance in the Guinness Book fashion easily imagined by any human pedestrian with a few months spare time and a supply chain of cool beverages and warm lodging along the way. This lone cat had threaded a gauntlet that would have given an elite force of Navy SEALs the night sweats. He had slinked and scampered across 500 glaring miles of naked prairie and industrial cropland controlled by a certain culture of guns and any predator hatred that had already dropped dozens of his fellow pilgrims in their paths. He had slipped through metropolises of millions abuzz with four-wheeled predators and guarded by skittish cops armed with orders to shoot. He had forded many of the mightiest rivers east of the Rockies, the Missouri, Mississippi, St. Lawrence, Hudson, and the busiest of eight-lane freeways, some of them rumbling to more than 100,000 vehicles a day. Through ferocious heat, cold, rain, and snow, feeding himself on the fly in a foreign land, he made his way as far east as a landbound animal could go to be stopped only by the Atlantic Ocean and two tons of speeding steel. There was good reason the young suitor from the Black Hills hadn't st stopped until hitting the Atlantic and probably would have continued on to Europe had there been an oceanic bridge and a few trees and deer planted on it. Never did he catch scent or sight of a female mountain lion. His passing was the proof. He had sampled a transect of Eastern America for native lions as no hound or human ever could, and he had found it wanting. Along the way, the lion had quietly disarmed those who would grab for their guns. The presumed serial killer at large had passed through uncounted barnyards, pastures, and corrals, past all the ready offerings of easy meat without incident. He had toured towns and cities swarming with two-legged enticements. He'd had the drop on officers Penny and Martin as they stood blind on the dark banks of the Mississippi. He may well have been watching as Dana Larson Ramsey unwittingly wandered past his dinner in the woods of Willow Lake. He had stood with only a lion's leap and a dead camera between himself and Doug Burdett. And he had walked on. Not one time in his two year tour of America was the lion known to have threatened a human soul, though many were the times he would have been executed as public enemy if so much is seen. That was my tribute to this, this great animal. And one of the reasons that I, I believe again that um, uh, these are, he was an emissary of hope. I, it was a tragic ending. He got hit by a car in Connecticut, but the fact that he made it this far told us so much about mountain lions that I, I felt like I needed to, to again, to honor um, his, his great journey. Well, I think I think you're right <clears throat> in that not only does that cat give us a great example of hope, but it, it's it's sort of a great example of <clears throat> um, you know what could be with rewilding, and I, I guess that's maybe sort of the same thing without our help even. So <clears throat> you know what could happen with our help, and uh, and and we've talked about some of those examples. Um, so. Um, were there any other pictures or slides that you wanted to to? Well, yeah, I, I did want to talk a little bit up again, but we're we're running out of time. But I was going to just I was going to. But this is a a a story that probably all of you have heard, and that's P twenty two. P twenty two was another animal that had a had an, a historic journey. His was only 20, 20 miles. It was uh, between the Santa Monica Mountains, um, twenty miles east, to a park. Uh, called Griffith Park. He crossed two of the, the, the busiest, most dangerous highways 
in the nation to do it. Um, and he became a celebrity. And um, again, I'm telling you a story that most of you have probably already heard. Unfortunately, December 17th, um, as a 12 year old cat, P22 died or was put down from injuries that he has sustained. Um, uh, it was, a, I think it was a very humane uh, euthanasia, but um, he adds to this story and that, um, uh, you know, just like this cat that made it all the way to the East, Walker, this animal, and now again, there's this, uh, uh, because of, of P22, um, we now have this $90 million um, overpass that's being built. They, they just broke ground this past year. They expect it to be done in two years. Uh, this is the, one of the largest of its kind. It's going to connect that little colony of Santa Monica Cougars where he was born and where he came from. So they don't have to make these dangerous crossings because every other animal like him that's tried that has been killed. So the, the lesson here for me and the lesson for Walker, the lesson from P22 is that, look, if, if 10 million Angelinos can, can tolerate a cougar in the middle of, of, of their lives, you know, if they can, this came from 5,000 different boat, um, people donating money to make this happen. The Angelinos are behind their cougars. If they can do that in California, why can't they do that in the East? I'll mention one other thing real quickly here. There are some people now who are attempting to uh, pave the road for repatriation of cougars in the East. They're already starting to do the uh, sociological surveys, some of the habitat surveys. The bottom line is there's plenty of habitat in the East for uh, cougars right there in Maine, the great north woods of Maine, all across, um, all the way across to Adirondacks, all the way down to the Alleghenies. Um, there is plenty of habitat and there's plenty of public support for this. Mm -hmm. um, it's there, it, what I'm hearing so far is that there's, there's two camps, three camps. There's people in the middle who really don't have much of an opinion. There's strong opinions on either side. The strong pro opinions are, are outnumbering the strong anti opinions anywhere from four to 13 to one. So we've got the momentum here. And I just, I'm just hoping that things like this are, are gonna keep it going for us. Great. Well, thank you. And, that, and that's yeah. actually a, a good segue to a question here from uh, Stephanie here, who says, who asks, oh, well, sorry about that. Um, no, you I'm just to... giving you something else to look at. Okay. Um, certainly apex predators are in bad shape. However, the context is that of a much broader decline in nature and, bio, and in biodiversity. I'd love to hear Will's thoughts about using these photogenic recognizable predator animals to lead efforts to protect nature and biodiversity. Does doing so risk giving not enough attention to the plight of uh, plight of biology of, of critters that are less sexy, both sexy? Yeah, no, great question. Um, that's the nice thing about the predators is that they're often referred to as umbrella species. If you can protect enough habitat for these great predators, you by de facto are, are uh, um, saving habitat for all the other things underneath. So you don't necessarily have to get everyone to like a burying beetle, for example, but if you can, if, if you can do that through saving somebody like um, a, a cougar or wolf pack or anything that needs huge expanses, uh, grizzly bears, whatnot, again, you are de facto saving a lot of the smaller species that, that, that actually go with them. There's a um, uh, uh, sort of a question to, the, to you or to the ethers, Roger Wheeler here, uh, and, and you touched on this a little bit in terms of climate change, but yeah, how much CO2 is prevented from being converted to oxygen carbon by overgrazing of plant eaters? You know, probably a lot. Um, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't go near that one. <laughs> so um, there's a couple of questions from Claire about coyotes, and, and I think you know, an early question I asked you was about, you know, what happens when uh, when we lose our apex predators? And, and so certainly one thing that happens is predator replacements. And Claire has a, has a few comments about the main eastern coyote. You know, do you consider it a keystone species or simply an important predator? I heard one biologist refuse to call our coyotes a keystone predator because their absence would, would let me see if I read this right, would, would would not denote a collapse of other wildlife ecosystems. To, to my knowledge, the eastern coyote is not a native. The coyote is a Midwestern species and, and has moved in here as a result of the loss of our cougars and wolves. Um, and so it's sort of a, now, now it is a, 
you know, it's a replacement apex predator probably, but um, not well, the way it started. Can you speak to that at all? Well, new development in that field, and and I've I've just learned of this, and maybe you folks have heard of it up there. You're much closer to it, but they've uh, just recently discovered a a wolf in uh, in the Adirondacks. Um, mm, yeah. yeah, wolf was killed by by a coyote hunter, as I understand it. Um, but it turns out, genetically speaking, that thing is a wolf. That's the idea. That I mean, just like the the cougar, there's no reason why we don't necessarily why we we don't have wolves in this. In, in, in the Northeast. Um, they're trying to make their way down. They're under heavy pressure up in Canada, but um, it just goes to show you that, you know, maybe like, like what happened in Yellowstone, a new order could be restored. And not that, not that I'm saying that we need to get rid of coyotes, but it, it, it's, not, it's not a done deal that we have to accept coyotes as an apex predator in the Northeast because um, we could have wolves. Yeah. Um, Kathy, uh... Claire points out there's a for, for locals, if you don't know about it, there's an excellent example of overbrowsing by deer on Swan Island, which will is a is a uh, state of wildlife uh, management area in the middle of Kennebec in Richmond here, where years ago they did a working with actually, I think it was Dow Chemical, that did, did a did some expert they were experimenting with deer repellents as there was deer overgrazing with a problem and they did fence off an area. You know, it was kind of like that, sorry, that one slide that you showed. And you know the fenced off area on Swan is just full of dense undergrowth and so forth. And everywhere else, there's this really high browse line. Um, Andrew is uh, uh, Luck is recommending a book, um, Rewilding: The Radical New Science of Ecological Recovery, by Jepson and Blythe. Where it's sometimes a controversial take on the subject. Um, and he and I think someone else mentioned a, a major shift in the human diet towards towards veganism or Vegetarianism would probably help carnivores, carnivores immensely. Yes, absolutely. It is true. Yeah, someone else, Tracy says, maybe U.S. diet needs to change. Do you agree, Will? Um, it does, does all of our hope rest on ecotourism? What about ratcheting back industrial livestock agriculture? Absolutely. I mean, again, the, the, the things we eat have a big impact on carnivore conservation because a lot of the land that's... Uh, that's a lot of the land in in the world right now beneath the ice caps is is devoted to agriculture and agriculture in many places again is 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 not considered compatible with big with big carnivores i mean we're seeing what's happening out west here and it's it's happening actually where i recently came from in florida whereby um you know they're they're not so happy with their panthers anymore so they're they're looking for ways to to get rid of them but yeah i mean if it's and and the thing that what the International um, Wildlife Coexistence Network is doing again is they're showing that these these things are not incompatible. But I mean, the other side of that coin is that you know we don't necessarily need to be clearing all this land and devoting all this land to things like cattle and sheep. I mean, there are certainly other ways to eat on this planet that are a lot more environmentally senses sensitive and with uh, with less uh, carbon footprint. So. And that's a whole other topic, but it's a big uh, one. It's a huge. Yeah. One. Uh, just sh shout out here and, and thank you for so Susan, uh, Suzanne Stone is actually on the on the call here, just, just here to support Will, moral support, but deeply appreciative of his kind words. If you want to learn more about the Wood River Wolf Project or other wildlife coexistence efforts, you can check it out on our website. I think you had that address up, Will, uh, yeah. wildlifecoexistence.org. Uh, Tracy asks, what are your take on wild horses, Will? <laughs> not natives. Uh, not natives. Uh, yeah, no, I that's that's a tough one. I, you know, because well, not not natives post I say post colonial. Let me just, yeah, I I can see wild horses from my study window every day. Not mm -hmm. right now because it's dark here, but um yeah, and I I can see what they're doing to the Great Basin ecosystem that I'm looking out at my window right now. There are way too many of them, but there's another thought there that, you know, way back in the Pleistocene before we lost all of this megafauna of ours, there used to be horses galore. I mean, this was, was the birthplace of the horse. And so there is an argument out there and I'm, I'm not quite sure which side I'm coming down on this yet, but um, uh, to me, the, the wild horse could be again, a proxy for some of the, if for those who are into the idea of rewilding, that could be a proxy for animals that used to really, uh, that populated 
this country. Now, um, people say, well, there's too many horses. They're just, well, you know, the, they're sharing the range now with other animals that really aren't native to their cattle and sheep and whatnot. So, um, you know, I think some of those arguments have to be taken with a grain of salt because again, there's a, you know, there's a, there's an agenda behind some of this. Um, but again, there's, uh, this place used to be rife with uh, several species of horses and, you know, they would beat the crap out of the range, but that was basically the way things went back there, you know, and they, um, there's no reason why I don't, you know, that why we couldn't Again, right now, and there's another interesting situation going on right here in Nevada in that um, we have lions who are learning to eat um, horses. You know, one of the problems is that the horses really don't have any natural predators, and that's been one of the arguments against them. Look, we can't, and they are reproducing um, uh, way too much for the ecosystem, but um, the idea of actually promoting mountain lions as, uh, as controls on on horses is something that the state unfortunately is not willing to to uh, consider but i mean there are certainly some proponents out there saying you know let's let's bring on and and then you know what about wolves you know i mean but you can't politically speaking you just can't go there but there are solutions to that and i think i personally i would like to see horses repatriate uh this country just as i would like to see wolves and mountain lions repatriate this country. Yeah, well, I think politics, you, you, that, that's, uh, that's sort of what, what John Davis says here in his comment, another key step toward carnival recovery is reforming wildlife management agencies so that they serve all wildlife, not maximize, quote, game. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. And that's the problem. I think most all of these state, you know, aid, state wildlife agencies, they're, they're, they're a large part of their payrolls have historically been paid by license fees. So they are, you know, they are, um, hunting agencies, or in the case of fishing, put and take, you know, agencies. And the, the DNA is, well, well, most of them have non-game divisions now. The DNA of, of that hunting um, background is so strong, it's really hard to overcome. And you know, while we're on that issue, Ed, let me just put in a real quick plug for a group called Wildlife for All. And, and, and their purpose is to do exactly what you're talking about. It was, is to, is to, um, uh, for better word, but is to change the way that uh, wildlife is managed, to give, to make it a more de democratic process, to involve those of us who don't necessarily want to see our, our wildlife dead, to have a seat at the table of these decisions for how wildlife is managed. Unfortunately, as, as you know, in, in most state agencies, it is a very slim uh, minority, a special interest that has the say on, on who lives and who dies. And uh, I, I, I would strongly suggest you check out this group, Wildlife for All, which are trying to, again, get a foot in the door and, and have a, a more democratic say on how our wildlife is managed. Well, that would be great. That's what we really need, do need to do. Um, Nate, Nate uh, chimes in that a wolf was documented here in Maine not long ago, about uh, 2022, hit by a car in Dixmont, Maine, all hush hush, which is what happens when these things happen. There was a there was a cougar in town where I was in, in Bodenham a number of years ago, one over in, not too far away in Jefferson, you know, and, and generally wildlife officials are pretty quick to say, oh, it was an escapee or, you know, it was a pet, pet that got away or something like that. I'm not sure that's the case, but. Um, did, they, did they run DNA on those? Uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I, well, I would be wary. I mean, and I'm, I'm sure there are people in, in the audience who, who know more specifically about that, but um, just in working with cougars, I'd be, I would be wary about those, um, you know, he said, she said, sort of, you know, somebody right. went over, um, get the, you know, get the animal in, in hand and get the DNA so that we can, and, and share it. Because the other thing I've learned is that not all these agencies, everyone has a, a, a reputation for trying to hide things. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. I certainly learned that from um, the Connecticut cougar. The Connecticut folks there are upfront and open about it. They would love to have cougars back. And so all this idea that they're trying to hide something or, you know, try to pull something over on people, it's just not necessarily true. So, you know, keep an open mind. Yeah. Um, and Chris uh, Spatz says, uh, just lets us know that he and John, uh, John Davis are out there in the Adirondacks now doing due diligence. I know they're doing some winter, winter wolf survey stuff right now. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck to you guys. I, I, I can't wait to hear what you found or what, I, if, I'm not sure if they're returning or they're already out there, but I, I, I think they're on the ground now. So yeah, I can't wait to catch up with them and hear what they found. Yeah. So I think, I think let's, um, let's call it good um, okay. for now, unless you want to chime in with anything else. I, I really, I really appreciate you um, being here tonight. Um, Will, I'm glad we had a good turnout. And I think again, again, thank Vance for uh, for uh, suggesting you as a as a presenter for us, and I hope hope you're happy with having been here as well. Well, thank you for everyone for attending, and and yeah, um, you know this is this is important stuff. I mean, if 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 yeah. you haven't thought about carnivores before, please do, because uh, you know, like I said, it's not just the science that we're talking about here, but there's some some real emotional um, some some real emotional gravity that goes with these animals that just cannot be replaced and um you know it would just be a shame if we if we just accepted this impoverished world as as the norm anymore so please by all means just you know, keep your heads up and keep your hopes great yeah. thanks thanks so much uh will yeah and thank you all for coming